thanks very much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to tell you about this refugee camp called Dadaab, which is the city of thorns of the title. I spent four years going to that camp, following uh, a range of people who live there, nine in, uh, whose lives are documented in the book. And the book talks about their ups, their downs, their lives in this very strange limbo place. So I'll just pause for a minute and let a couple of people sit down. OK. So to get an idea of Dadaab, what I'd like you to do is to imagine a city of half a million people. That's about the size of metropolitan New Orleans, or Zurich, or Bristol in the UK. And imagine a city like that with no permanent structures, with no sewage facilities, with no running water, with no sanitation, with no proper roads, with no power. And imagine that those people are not allowed to leave the city. And imagine that they're not allowed to work. What would that look like? And the answer is, it looks a bit like this. It's stuck in the middle of the desert. There are thorn bushes all around. And after a couple of years, when your tent disintegrates that you've been given by the UN, you're forced to cut some of those thorn trees down and make a little house to live in. Because in the middle of the dry season, it gets up to about 45 degrees centigrade, which is uh, 105, 110 degrees Fahrenheit. It's very hot. And in the rainy season, of course, the whole place it pretty much floats, because this flat plain on bedrock made of dust and mud, when the, when it, when the rainy season comes, all of that has nowhere to go. So everybody pretty much drowns in water. And at, at the moment, there is a cholera epidemic in the camp because every rainy season, without the sanitation, the disease just licks through the camp like wildfire. The way that people survive in the camp is through food rations, which all of us, through our tax dollars, contribute to the United Nations, pay for. And though that, those food rations are distributed every two weeks, and they constitute uh, a portion of rice, maybe some sorghum, maybe some maize, maybe some beans, and a little bit of oil. It's around 2,000 calories, which are finely balanced and finely costed. And the World Food Program distributes that to everybody. Um, this city has been there for 25 years. There have been people eating those rations for 25 years. And they've never left. There are now three generations, two generations of people who've been born there. So some people came in the 1990s when the camp was originally established after the Somali Civil War. And their children have now had children. So you have whole generations that have grown up without ever seeing any other horizon. I'd like to tell you the story of one man in particular, uh, one of these nine who I interviewed there. Uh, over the, the course of four years while doing the research for this book. And he's a young man called Guled. He's now uh, just over 20 years old. Uh, when I met him, he was 17. And he was born in Mogadishu in 1993, about the time that Black Hawk Down happened, those two American helicopters that were shot down in Mogadishu, which brought to an end the Bush Clinton sponsored intervention in Somalia. And after that, the US left, the UN left, and Somalia pretty much had no government up until now. So Guled was born then. So his life is a very interesting arc, which pretty much mirrors the collapse of Somalia and the rise of this refugee camp. He grew up in Mogadishu. He scrabbled around. He lost his parents. He, was, he found a living one way or another. And interestingly, throughout this war, he kept going to school. He kept going to a small primary school in Mogadishu. And one day in 2010, in the middle of the war, every day there's bombs going off. He's taking a different route to get to school. And one day he goes to school. And a couple of pickup trucks show up full of Al-Shabaab militants. 
Al-Shabaab is allied to Al-Qaeda. It's a, an extremist radical group. And they control, at that point, they controlled about 80% of Somalia. Now they control a bit less, but they're still a big force. So one day he's in class. These guys pitch up at the back of the classroom. He looks at the teacher. He sees the teacher freeze. He knows something's up. He turns around and he sees these seven guys in the room. They take all of the tallest boys in the class. They blindfold them. They put them in a pickup truck and they take them to a training camp. For a month, He's in a training camp, and he is being taught to uh, recite the Quran. He's being taught how to handle a weapon. He's being taught to, um, uh, eventually he's assigned to something called the Hizbat, which is the police, the morality police that Al-Shabaab used to make sure that the people in the areas that they control are abiding by the Sharia law that they uh, espouse. The elite group is called the, the Istiyahdin, which is the suicide bombing group. And some of the kids, of course, wanted to, to join that group, the ones who had volunteered. But the, the conscripts, the people who had been kidnapped like him, were assigned to the Hizbat. So he was then trying to be, he was then sent out on these patrols to police in Mogadishu. After around a month, he managed to escape. And he had Funnily enough, for a 16-year-old kid, he had a wife. Because in the war, life is short. And as a result of that, people are increasingly marrying younger and younger and younger. And I mean, it's something we see in, in poor and conservative societies all over the world, very, very young marriages. He had a wife. When he escaped, he was too scared to go to his wife because he was worried that the, the Al-Shabaab would follow him and would punish the wife as well. So he, d he called her, he said, I'm running away to Kenya, to the refugee camps. And he left without seeing her. <coughs> he got to the camp after this very long journey. He had no money when he arrived. He had one guy that he knew who he lived there. And through a complete stroke of luck, he managed to find that guy. And that guy showed him how the camp worked. He took him into his house. He lived with this friend of his called Noor, who's also 16, 17 years old. Noor showed him how the rations work, showed him how to get his ration card, how to register with the UN. He showed him uh, how to, um, he showed him how to try and work. Because after all of this time, what, uh, after you know, making this journey, getting to the camp, living with Noor, what Guled really wanted to do was to phone his wife and to tell her where he was and to see how she was doing, because still there's a war going on in Mogadishu. He wanted to see what was going on. But the principal challenge of the refugee camp is how to get cash, because there's, this is an economy that operates pretty much without money. He was surviving on the, the food rations that his friend had been given, um, but his friend didn't have a job. He couldn't, couldn't get any money either. So in order to make a phone call to his wife to tell her where he was, the first day that he got his ration card, went to collect his food rations from the United Nations. He goes outside. He sells the rations for $2. Those $2 allow him to go to the phone shop in the market to make a phone call to tell his wife, I'm here in the refugee camp. I'm OK. He starts telling Mariam, his wife, what it's like. There's food, there's shelter, there's peace. He's heard that maybe there's the possibility of getting resettled to the United States. Mariam thinks, that sounds quite good. The war here is pretty bad. I want to come. He says, great, great, you can come. She says, but I don't have the fare for the bus to get from Mogadishu to Kenya, which is around 400 miles. You've got to send money so I can come. So now he has another challenge. How does he get money to send to Mariam to bring her there? As I said, there's no money in the camp. People can't work. There are no jobs. Everyone's surviving on these rations. So he tries his hand at portering. There's a black market. As you'd expect, a city, informal city like this after 25 years, a black market has emerged. There, is, there are some shops. There are buses. There are trucks. There are things going on. There are phone shops. Um, but he, of course, is a new arrival. He's not part of that. So he starts trying to do 
a portering job. He tries to carry rations from the distribution site on behalf of women, family members who are not very strong, who can't carry these big sacks of, of food. But of course, he can't lift them. He's small. He's a young guy. He's desperately trying to pick up these big sacks so that he can earn 50 bucks so that he can pay the fare of his wife to come. To cut a long story short, he doesn't raise the money. In the end, she borrows the money in Mogadishu. She comes and joins him in the camp. And it turns out she's pregnant. These two young people, 17 years old, 18 years old, embark on a new life now in the refugee camp. She's, he's told her all these wonderful things about how it's safe and how there's food and so on. When she gets there, she has a very different take on things. It's really hot. She's pregnant. She wants juice. She wants fruit. None of these things are available. She's living in this crappy stick house. She used to live in a concrete house in Mogadishu. The principal complaint that I heard over and over again from Mariam is, at least we had a washing machine in Mogadishu. In Dadaab, water's scarce. You have to line up with 100 other people to wait your turn at the tap with your big yellow UN-issued jerry can just to get the water. So they have a very difficult time. Fast forward now four years. In the book is the story of Mariam and Guled and how they struggled in the camp and how that struggle put pressure on their marriage and all of the different things that, that emerged from that. But I'd just like to take you up to the end of that story, where after a famine, after uh, the Kenyan military invaded Somalia, after the breakdown of law and order in the camp, after police operations in the camp beating people up, Guled running for his life from the police again in Kenya this time, not from al-Shabaab in Somalia. After all of these ups and downs, we get to early 2015. Guled and Mariam have by now have had two children, and there's another one on the way. And Guled is terrified of going back to Somalia. He can't go back to Somalia. The UN has just started voluntary repatriation back to Somalia after a lot of pressure from Kenya, trying to push these refugees back home again. Mariam thinks, finally, yeah, this is a good idea. We can go. We can go back now. But for Guled, that's not an option. He was kidnapped. He remembers those guys in black. He remembers that fear. He's worried about the revenge from these people. So they're a bit stuck. They don't really know what to do. They're having a crisis in their family. But Guled, this, this dilemma that he's in, precisely encapsulate, encapsulates the dilemma that everybody in the camp is facing. Because after 25 years, you're supposed to have some kind of solution, some kind of future, some kind of hope for your life. But he can't go back to Somalia. He can't go down into Kenya to claim asylum in Kenya, because Kenya has a roadblock south of the camp. It doesn't let anybody go into Kenya proper. And there are no slots for resettlement abroad. And this is the crux of our current global refugee problem, that once upon a time you went to a refugee camp, it was a temporary thing. And while you were there, the rich nations in the world would relocate, would take quotas of people who needed a, a safe place to stay. And the refugee burden would be shared. But we've got to such a point now, because that pipeline has shrunk and shrunk and narrowed and narrowed, and the rich countries don't want refugees. They certainly don't want Muslim refugees because of the Islamophobia that has been a feature of you know, our modern rich societies ever since 9-11. That, that quota has got smaller and smaller. And as that quota has got smaller and smaller, these refugee camp populations have grown and grown and grown. And there are many, many people like Guled who are simply stuck in these very, very difficult domestic scenarios, trying to, as you can imagine, refugee life puts incredible pressure on a family, uh, the difficulties for the kids growing up with very, very small opportunities for them to go to school, with all of the health problems that I talked about, malnutrition, 
cholera, and so on. So this refugee system is broken. And I'll talk a little bit later about ways in which we, need, we could think about fixing it. But for Gouled, I left him at the beginning of 2015, at the, the last chapter, the end of this book, I left him wrestling with the idea of Europe. And this is why Europe, for people in sub-Saharan Africa, is some kind of solution, or at least a dream of a solution, even though it's expensive, even though it's dangerous and difficult. So he has no money, but he's sitting with his friends in the camp, and he gets all of these guys in a football team. They're all friends with each other. They get a phone call from one of their teammates who made it to Italy, who spent probably around $10,000 to get to Italy on one of those leaky boats. And he phones back to the refugee camp and says, you've got to come. It's great. There's work. I'll send you money you know, so you can come too. And he's selling them this idea, even if it's quite, not quite as, he, as he's painting it. That's the image that's coming down the phone line that's getting all these guys energized. And for somebody like Gouled, who wants to look after his family, he wants some kind of future, he wants a chance to work, Europe represents this crazy idea of, of hope, at least some kind of future, when you can't go anywhere else, you can't go back to Somalia, staying in the camp is completely miserable. So when I left him, that was the dilemma he was in. That was the situation he was stuck in. Do I go to Europe without money and try and blag my way, try and find some route through Sudan, through Darfur, through the Sahara, into Libya, up onto the coast to Benghazi, places like that, Misrata, and then across to Italy? Or do I stick it out in the camp, see how I go, Meanwhile, the food rations have been cut by 30% because the UN has a crisis with the Syrian funding for Syria. So people in Dadaab are going hungry because there's not enough food to eat. Like I said, you know, his, his kids now are going to have to fight for a place at primary school. There's cholera. It's not a good situation. I recently checked Guled's Facebook profile, and on it, it says he's from Ghana, and he recently visited Paris, France. And there's a photo of him photoshop, his face photoshopped onto the body of Wayne Rooney, the player for Manchester United, because he's a big Man U fan. And his whole feed on Facebook is about Manchester United and pictures of Man U players and so on. He's living an imaginary life online that is unavailable to him in reality. And if you look at a lot of his friends, a lot of the other people I know in the camp, they're all doing it. You see people from Cincinnati, Ohio, from Athens, Georgia, from Stockholm, Sweden, and you see them in front of the Eiffel Tower in all these nice clothes that they don't own, but they've pasted their own face onto these other images. So they're trying to lay claim to these images that, are, that they don't have. And that gives you some sense of this, the isolation of this place, where they're, they're, it's they're in the world. It's a bit like Zen Buddhism. They're in the world, but not of the world. They're a product of it, but they're not participating in it fully. They're kind of orphaned in this limbo world. So I've tried to give you a, a brief portrait of, of the place and some of the, the stories. There are eight other stories. I've given you one. There are eight other characters, people in this book. Um, and I'd just like to pose some questions to to Google in, in particular, but also to us as people who don't live in a refugee camp, who participate in a rich, uh, so, you know, so the society of rich countries, let's call it. Um, what does this mean, to, mean for us, and you know, why should we think about it? Firstly, I think it's important to realize this is not a European refugee crisis. I was quite surprised to see how it's always represented in the American media as a European refugee crisis. Whereas in Europe, we see the newspapers and it's, it's the global refugee crisis. Of course, everybody's very, self, very egocentric, and that's how countries like to see it, see these stories. But it's important, I think, to understand it as a global refugee crisis, partly because, as I said, it's about this refugee quota pipeline, the refugee system that's broken, which is why people are going to Europe. 
they're only going to Europe because Europe's closer and Europe's cheaper. Those who have money are actually paying twice the amount. It's about $10,000 to go from Somalia to Europe. To go to the United States, the illegal route via Angola or South Africa into Latin America and up through Mexico is around $20,000, $25,000. But it's a, that is a route that is growing, that people are increasingly choosing. Plus, the United States, uh, you know, Canada, other, other rich countries have a responsibility, have UN responsibilities to share this burden. Um, and they're not doing that, which is why this pipeline is, is blocked and why people are choosing to go to Europe. The other reason people are choosing to go to Europe is because the Syrians are learning from the Somali experience that a refugee camp is not a temporary thing. We, they know if we go there, we're going to be stuck there. And they're therefore choosing to go the illegal route. So in order to stay in a refugee camp, in order to keep people there, they've got to have some kind of hope that th that, that place is going to be useful for them. Either that they can gain some skills and experience while they wait, or that it might be uh, a departure lounge for somewhere else. And in the absence of any kind of hope, these individuals manufacture their own hope, which is partly what Gouled's Facebook is about and partly what the book is also about. So understanding it as a global refugee crisis is important. And I think for you know, corporations like Google to understand that we're now at 60 million globally displaced people. That's the same as the population of Great Britain. And it's the fastest growing population on the, in, on the earth. If it was a country, it would be a country the size of the UK that's growing faster than any other because of the numbers of people being displaced and because of the birth rate in these camps. The birth rate in Dadaab is 1,000 a month. Now, the US, to give you some kind of perspective, takes around 1,000 people from Dadaab every year for resettlement. There's no way the UK takes around 100. Sweden takes around 60. There's no way that that number is going to go down while the camp is reproducing as it is. So globally, collectively, we're all going to have to bite that bullet at some point because the numbers of people in these protracted refugee uh, situations are growing and growing. These cities in limbo are growing and growing of themselves, but also because of these crises which don't get solved. Central African Republic, Sudan, Syria, Iraq, and so on. You've still got a million people in Pakistan from Afghanistan, from all of those wars that are not going home. So this limbo situation is one that we need to understand. And I think we should think about both as a, as a problem, something which global citizens and global corporate citizens have a responsibility to try and think about, and also as an opportunity. Um, Mark Zuckerberg promised to connect all refugee camps in the world within, I think, 10 years, something like that. He, he set a, a deadline. And I think that ambition is admirable. I think it's great that these communities should be connected. They need to be connected. We need to somehow have a way of relating to them. They need to be integrated into society and also into the economy. But what do you do with that connectivity? That's the question. Because for, at the moment, Facebook mostly is, is just a wind up for these people. They're looking at all these images that they can't have. They're being told about these lifestyles that are unavailable to them. And it, it's really a source of depression. There's a word, there's a guy in the, in the, in the book who talks about this thing called bufis, which is uh, a Somali, it's, it's actually a, a condition that was coined in the refugee camp. It means a longing for another life. So you're kind of stuck in this melancholy situation where you don't like your own life, but you're wishing for another one. So the connectivity, in some senses, can contribute to mental illness. On the other hand, it could contribute to some positives for those people. Um, and this is where I think it would be good to, to, for Google to think about a couple of things. I mean, one of them is, uh, how, do you, how do you start incorporating those cities in limbo with each other? And how do you start incorporating them with the countries where they're actually located, because these guys have almost no relationship to Kenya, apart from through the, tr the truncheons of the Kenya police. And then, how do you start incorporating those populations, connecting those populations with 
the rest of us, in the rest of the world. Uh, in Kenya, they're forbidden to work, but in Jordan, they're not. In Pakistan, they're not. These are captive populations of young people who would seize any opportunity with an incredible amount of zeal. So they are in the process of doing online degrees, um, diplomas, things like that. There are some pilot projects where people in the refugee camps are being employed. They're being outsourced to do jobs. Something that I thought about that I've talked about with some people in the camp is trying to learn how to code trying to learn programming so that they could build basic software and platforms within the camp that might make camp life better, that might solve some of the problems that they have in the camp, that they could then use that language or those tools to adapt to their own situation. Um, another issue is language. Google Translate has been very useful to a lot of the refugees on that journey from Syria and, and from Sub-Saharan Africa over into Europe, into Europe. But the European languages are not, in the camp, the European languages are not what they need. They need, you, you need uh, Google Translate for Somali, you need Google Translate for Eritrean, for Amharic, for Oromo, for all of these other languages that people are speaking in the Horn of Africa. Um, and that would be massively useful to those guys. Um, the last thing is, street map, street view even. Not only would it just be really interesting to see what the camp looks like, but I can foresee all sorts of applications for that kind of mapping, that kind of very, very specific imagery and specific GPS positioning, which could be very useful for policing, for uh, you know, issues that they have around sexual violence, around you know, pinpointing water problems, all sorts of stuff where that kind of mapping technology could be very useful. I'm sure you guys could think of all sorts of other things uh, based on all the specialisms that you do that I don't know about, which may be useful to this place. But hopefully my, my role by just giving you a flavor of this limbo of these people who are stuck there um, and how the camp, at least an, a brief idea about how this camp works and what it's like to live there, you can imagine you know, how that might be relevant to your work or how your work might be relevant to that. And the last point I'd like to finish on is that these numbers are only going to grow. And there's been some discussion in the UK about climate change, perhaps more than here, I don't know, but the, the numbers that we're seeing displaced by war are going to be peanuts compared to the numbers of people that are going to be on the move when whole swaths of countries become uninhabitable. And that's not that far away. That's maybe 20 years, 40 years, certainly within our lifetimes. Large numbers of people are going to be moving, especially from these parts of the world, from sub-Saharan Africa, where it's already too hot, really, sometimes, some parts of the year, and it's getting hotter. And El Nino this year is then making it wetter. So areas that have been completely deforested, are incredibly hot in the dry season, are then literally floating in the wet season. We're going to see more and more of those kinds of climate refugees. And that is a lot more general and a lot less specific than war. Um, so we're going to need to fix this global refugee system that doesn't work. And we're going to need to come up with all sorts of innovative solutions, including technological ones, that deal with temporary cities and that deal with temporary societies and connect people despite all of these ideas of race and nationality and so on, all this nonsense that divides us. Let me stop there and let me invite questions from anybody. Thank you. <laughs> Samir. So is there um, any history of successfully converting refugee camps into permanent functional cities that are healthy. That I, I, I guess by default in this case it would mean Kenya takes all the refugees as Kenyan, um, but are there in smaller instances that have actually successfully made that transition? So it's not about getting out, but making the camp <coughs> into a proper place to live. Yeah. Um, there are. Uh, sometimes it's happened 
sort of de facto just because this place has been there so long. So there's a town called Kasala in southern Sudan which has been there for about 50 years now. And it's still predominantly refugee population of Eritreans, but uh, it's, it's become its own city, more or less. Um, Dadaab is going that way. You have Gaza. You have the camps in Lebanon and Beirut, which are now pretty much suburbs of Beirut. Um, you have the West Bank, of course. That, but the Palestinian situation is sort of specific. Um, but it's becoming the rule. It's becoming the norm. It was supposed to be a kind of exception, but actually that's the way it's going. You do have examples of, there's a town, I forget the name, in Belgium that after World War II was a refugee camp. And it was leased from a university. And they, they took over the buildings and it sort of grew and grew and grew and grew. And the town council then took on the mandate of improving the, I think, I think the university uh, invested in the town and made the town um, it grew the town and then eventually after like 50 years there was a lease process that they handed the town back to the to the city council and then the, the city council took it on again so there is there are some legal precedents for doing things like that the main problem is is not so much the precedence in the legal situation the problem is the prejudice is the prejudice of the Kenyan government the Kenyan government doesn't want this place to become permanent because it doesn't want 400,000 half a million Somalis getting Kenyan citizenship. So what you have to try and work with is acknowledge those fears, as illegitimate as they may be, and as illegal as they may be, because if, if people seek asylum, you have to grant them citizenship after a period of time. I mean, that is the law, that is international law. Um, but every, most countries flout that. Um, so you have to acknowledge that fear, and then you have to try and work with the Kenyan government and say, well, maybe actually here there might be something to benefit you in the end. And I can foresee a model where you had open cities that were run by the UN, where if you did insist on controlling population movements, you could do that, but at the same time, you could invest in the place. You could make it a humane place to live where there wasn't disease and hunger and, and all of these problems, and possibly where people could move between them. Like, OK, you don't want refugees to come into Kenya, fine but maybe they can get on the plane and they can go to Mogadishu and then they can take a flight to the UK and they can visit the UK with a visa and then they can go home again. You know, if that home is not so terrible, you know, then you're subject, subject to the normal visa regime. But I mean, that's a big leap of overcoming an awful lot of xenophobia and racism that we currently live with. Okay. One, sorry, one, two, three. I'm just making a note. So I start with the back and then come to you. And you can repeat the questions for the recording. Okay. Yes. Um, so I guess you talked about uh, the xenophobia and the prejudice about absorbing these large populations. Um, but I think there's, there's also the issue that you know, a lot of world strife happens because you get political boundary that doesn't match the cultural boundaries within it. So I think it's one thing to say, well, we'll take some stream of refugees that we can incorporate into our society. It's a very different one to say, you know, we'll take 500,000 people en masse, which are then going to potentially, over time, become a destabilizing. Mm. I'm just saying there's, that it, it seems to create a, I mean, a lot of extra complexity in that situation. Yes, the, the question was about the borders that don't necessarily match cultural, cultural borders, and you may have communities that exist in one state but may have affinity with, with another. I, I mean, you're right, the Kenyan government is in a difficult position, um, an unenviable position. It's very hard for them. If there were you know, half a million Scottish people <laughs> in England and Scotland was a separate country and we didn't trust them and, you know, I'm sure there would be all of those sorts of issues. What, the point about the border is correct. There, there's a, a, as I deal with in the book, in fact, the border should have been about 200 miles further south because those, that population of northern Kenya was historically Somali and they wanted to join Somalia and the British said, no, 
we're going to give it to, to Kenya. So in one, one of the guys in the book, Tawane, his grandparents grazed camels on that land where the refugee camp now is. And he's a refugee, but actually, historically, it's his land. So, you know, the British colonialism has a lot, <laughs> has a, lot of, a big can to carry, uh, um, and, and so do other countries. So uh, it, it is difficult, but that's not to say that we shouldn't try and overcome those things. And we need to find ways of incorporating these populations. Like I said, there were going to be more of them. So if we want, you know, our idea of the nation state might need to shift a little bit. You know, these sort of myths of nationhood we, uh, are always pernicious and have long-lasting effects, but we, we now actually have quite utilitarian reasons for, for unlocking them a little bit. Yes? So are things better or worse now than before? Like, it seems like there's an unprecedented refugee crisis, or it feels that way, but is that just because people are surviving now when they never would have before? Like, you know, 500 years ago, like, war is nothing new. There's always been really bad wars, but... I assume like 500 years ago, you would have like millions of people displaced in the war, and then they would just all die. Like there was no UN giving them food. Like no, well, people. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know enough about history to compare over the course of, of many years. I mean, there were massive population displacements in World War II. That was the last time, certainly in Europe and in and in East Asia, there were big, big population displacements. What we, what, when people say that we are in the midst of a global refugee crisis now, and they talk about the figure of 60 million, that is the largest since World War II. Because in World War II, I, I, no, I'm not sure of the numbers, but it was probably up there. Um, but what happened then was you, know, you, had, you had borders being redrawn you know, because of these refugees. You had, you had, I think, two million people, UNHCR, resettled in Europe, moving them around. Are we, uh, you know, is Europe and, and, and the United States and other countries, are we now moving two million people? Are we accepting them from other countries? Germany's taken, what, 800,000, which is unprecedented. But they have their own political reasons for doing that. It's great, um, but they are suffering from a declining population. They have labor shortages. There is a big political constituency to accept those people in Germany, which other countries in Europe don't have. So. We need a Marshall Plan for dealing with the current crisis. It hasn't come out of nowhere. It has a long, as I said, it's, it's been building for a long time. What's interesting or what's sort of new is the fact that only now are we waking up to the fact that there are all these people who are displaced. And the only reason we've woken up to it in the West is because they've started arriving on the doorstep of Europe. That's the only reason it's in the media. I've been covering refugee issues for 10 years with Human Rights Watch. There's been thousands of people dying in the Mediterranean since 2000, since 9-11, even before. But it was never really a news story because it's 300 dead Africans in a boat. You know, All of a sudden, it's 300 dead Africans in a boat. But hang on, there's a million who are actually making it. And now that's the story. So it, it, what's new is not the refugee crisis as much as the perception of it. The numbers are rising, but they've been rising for a long time. Yes? Uh, two questions. Well, one statement, one question. I vaguely remember reading at some point that there was the mapping of slums. I don't know if it was, I, it's most probably a NGO that used Google technology to do that. But I remember they had used like local people in the slums to actually start mapping yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, to, to quickly explain, well, there's food here, and there's this, and yeah. there. Um, the second question is, a question to you is, do you know if there is a plan for uh, those, those huge movements of population at some point when there's going to be environmental problems? Are, are there plans for that yet? Are people talking about it actively? First, the two questions. The first one was about uh, an, an NGO that used Google technology to map slums. And the second question was about whether or not there are forward plans for thinking about the refugee consequences of global warming. The first question, I know of an NGO in Nairobi called Spatial Collective, who are, shout out, they're a fantastic organization. And they've done this mapping of slums in Nairobi. Um, it would be great to see that rolled out elsewhere, to see them partner with you know, other bigger organizations. Um, 
and it's had very material improvements in people's lives in terms of their access to services, knowing what's going on, that kind of thing. Because information is the first casualty in a, in a situation like that where rumor is, is everything. And you, know, you hear that the UN canceled rations and all of a sudden everybody's saying that, you know, actually, we're, or the UN's cut rations by 30% and all, the rumor is that the UN stopped giving food altogether and they want us to starve. And, you know, so getting good information is key. The second point, no, I mean, we're talking in terms of global warming refugees, we're talking decades down the line. I wouldn't be surprised if the CIA and MI6 and NASA are starting to think about it. I wouldn't be surprised at all. I haven't seen those plans. Um, I'm pretty sure that you know, in, in some of the sort of disaster planning for climate change, that, that's been talked about. There's a, a renegade scientist in the UK called James Lovelock who has talked about how the UK needs to prepare for big numbers of refugees from mainland Europe because large parts of southern Europe are going to become too hot and people are going to start moving north. But, you know, that, it's something we need to start thinking about. Yes? Yeah, the question is about UN funding and uh, whether there's been any, any increase in the response to stop people starving. Um, the, there has been an increase, but I mean, the way that it works is that the, the UN is the collective embodiment of all of the members. And the member states are the UK, my country, the US, all the, all the other countries of the world. There are standing contributions to the UN, and then there are emergency contributions whenever there's a problem. So UNHCR, the UN uh, Refugee Agency, has a, a kind of budget that it draws down from the general pot, but that's not enough, um, which is why refugees in, in Dadaab are having their rations cut by 30%. And earlier in the year, refugees in all of the Syrian camps we also had their rations cut by 30% because the UN could not feed everybody. So it seems to me that, uh, and, the, and the way to fill that gap is for rich governments to plug the hole. So I know that the British government, for example, made extra donations to the Syrian refugees, but nobody gave money to the Somalis because they're forgotten about and they're not on the TV screens. And in this world of une you know, imperfect democracy, unfortunately, what's on television is how the politicians respond. So in my view, all of the nation, you know, all of us who are citizens of our nation states need to make sure that our nation states remember everybody and at the minimum feed these people. You can't put them in a refugee camp, forbid them from leaving the refugee camp and then not feed them. I mean, that's a crime on, I mean, that's, to me, that's, a, that's almost a war crime. That's a crime against humanity, not forcing people to starve and people are dying. Uh, I'll take both questions and try and answer them together. Can you go ahead? Uh, yes. Do you have insight into what the standard infrastructure for a camp is? So let, let's say the UN shows up, they set up, uh, they set up tents for sure, but then what about water, communication, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, education? Okay. And the other question? Is that a hand? No, OK. Uh, the two questions, the first one was about the infrastructure of a refugee camp, um, what that looks like, how it works. And I suppose, relatedly, the second question was about uh, the, in, in the motivation for not allowing the refugees to work. Um, the refugee camp model is something that's a, a little bit outdated. It was something that the UN did a lot in the 1990s, when a host government had a big refugee population and they couldn't cope like uh, with Bosnia, with Kosovo, uh, with Rwanda. So Tanzania would say to the UN, we can't cope. We need you to come and set up camps. We don't want to allow that population to integrate into our society. We want you to put them in camps. 
technically it's illegal. You're supposed to allow refugees freedom of movement. But what happens is the governments find a way around it by requiring movement passes, a bit like apartheid South Africa, where you're in a camp, it's like a Bantu stand, you need a pass to come out and join the rest of the world. So they find these funny ways of trying to regulate it and arguing that it's legal, but it's not. Um, but still, in fast-moving emergencies, the UN, that is the only way that you can look after people. If you've got 50,000 people who've just run from a, border, from a town in South Sudan, which is burning, and they need food and shelter and so on, a camp, a temporary city, is the only way that you're going to look after them. And then over time, of course, they become permanent. But what that is is, yes, it, as you say, it's tents, it's mobile hospitals to start with, which then become permanent. Over time, it's schools, um, often boreholes to bring the water in, or you're trucking water in, and then it's food. So in Dadaab, you still have an emergency feeding situation where you're shipping 8,000 tons of food a month, most of that from the United States because the US gives food aid in kind. It doesn't give cash mm -hmm. to the UN for its own reasons, because that's helpful. Um, so that food aid has to be shipped, has to come up, travel three days by truck into the middle of the desert in order to feed everybody. Your transportation costs are about four times the cost of the actual food. If only we could give them the money, you know. But that is part of US government's political decisions about how it uses its, uh, how it meets its obligations and also benefits its own citizens. So, there are all sorts of contradictions in keeping these things going. So that's the infrastructure. And you know, it, after 25 years, or 40 years, or 50 years, some of those things have evolved, and some of those haven't. The, the prohibition on work is because it's an age-old narrative. In, in Britain, there's this you know, common, common uh, political epithet. We don't want them taking our jobs. There's this assumption that immigrants and refugees take jobs from, from nationals. Generally, all the economic evidence is that people create more wealth and more jobs than they take. But for the right-wing uh, xenophobes, it, that's an easy play to make. So that's, and Kenya believes very much, to answer the, the question of the, the other second question, Kenya believes very much that these, it, these refugees present a threat to the economic prospects of Kenyans. Um, even though that's not the case. It's a politically useful story to tell when you as a politician are facing pressure for why you haven't generated any economic opportunities for your people, especially in an area like northern Kenya, which is very marginalized, a lot of corruption, leaders who are, I, I would say, are, you know, haven't done their people very proud, have not really looked after their populations. It's very easy to blame all the problems on the refugees. I've probably got time for one more, maybe, or two more questions. Are there any? Samir. So it seems like uh, maybe you're making a presumption of more help than there is, but there is a huge amount of work to be done at a camp, right? Just taking garbage and sewage out from you know, the latrines or living areas yeah. elsewhere, find elsewhere. Um, any sort of cleaning, any sort of movement of material. Does the work just not happen, or is work within the camp considered OK? Uh, is there an organization of labor within the camp? Well, increasingly, what's happening as the, the budget is going down and down, and the UN can't manage on its own, what's happening is it's enlisting the refugees as volunteers to run the camp. Now, to some ex on some level, that's good. Um, but on another level, you're asking refugees sometimes to do technical jobs, like teaching, like being water engineers, like being sanitation engineers. And you're asking them to do it without the proper equipment, without the proper support. So what happened recently was that there was no, um, there was no sanitation. The UN just cut the budget, said we're not paying for people to collect rubbish anymore. And it just piled up in the streets. And, and the sewage was everywhere. And you know, I mean, it's bad anyway, but it got even worse. So the refugees organize themselves. They, uh, you know, because of the prohibition on work, they're not allowed to be paid like Kenyan workers. So instead, they volunteer and they get paid a stipend. 
So they, the stipend is about $70 a month. So often, because you can't get enough Kenyan teachers to go into the schools to teach the people in the city, you're enlisting refugee teachers who are working, they're not trained, they're working as, te as primary school teachers, secondary school teachers even, and they're being paid $70 a month, and they're next to a Kenyan teacher who's being paid by the Kenyan government and who's earning 1000 or 1500 or something like that. So it's incredibly unfair. It's in, it, it, the, the incentives to, to volunteer are, are quite low, but people do it when the situation gets too bad. So it, yeah, it's, it's very badly organized, really. Yep. OK, last one. Yeah, there's definitely, the question was about whether people continue their old professions in the camp once they, once they move there. There's definitely an element of that, but often you can't always find, you know, there isn't the job to do or, you know. But there's, there certainly is an element of self-organizing. What would be great would be if the refugees were empowered more to organize themselves and to run things and given the proper support and the proper budget and the, the equipment and so on. You know, for example, there's a community police force. What they want, more than anything, is boots, because you can't get good shoes in a refugee camp. Everybody's either barefoot or in flip-flops. Um, and the other thing they want is two-way radios, because they're all using their own mobile phones. And they get given a little bit of phone credit, like scratch cards, to top up their, their phones. But often that's not enough. or it runs out or whatever. What they want is two-way radio so that they can communicate about, you know, they're patrolling, they don't have weapons, but if there's a problem, they call the police. But they, in order to call the police, they have to have a cell phone with credit on it. So it's tiny things like that, that if you supported them properly and allowed them to do their own thing, they could make the camp a better place. Um, I'll stop there with the questions, um, but on the theme of making the camp a better place, uh, I hope that those of you watching and, and those of you here might have some inclination to think a little bit about how you might be able to help make that a better place. Thanks a lot.